Okay, now we're actually live, I can start. Uh, so yes, uh, this is a session, as you might have expected, for third year project talks. Uh, and we're gonna be going, going through a range of different things, whether that be uh, machine learning or algorithms or um, you know, more general software engineering projects. Uh, hopefully you'll find this useful. We have, uh, we have six talks and one backup talk as well, which should have be happening, as long as nobody runs over too much. Uh, <laughs> and as you can tell, we are very organized at doing streams. I mean, as long as you're standing, <laughs> there we go, okay. Uh, so firstly, I'll be handing it over to Abude, who is doing uh, a talk, well, a talk about their project on a very long title. Hello, I've never used this mic before, it's weird. Okay, I think everyone can see me now. So, um, welcome everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking generally about my project and I'll also give you some specific tips which should help you with your specific projects. Um, okay, so, um, let me just do a few polls because um, I'm curious. How many of you are second years here? Just raise your hands. Okay, so majority, okay, good, good. Um, okay, the main reason I'm here today is because um, I'm procrastinating my exams which are very soon. I was assuming some of you might be doing this as well. But okay, so how many of you are thinking about a more research-oriented project? Very few, okay, that was like me, I didn't like those. Um, what about a more application-oriented, so more software or some web app? Okay, and how many of you want at least some kind of machine learning in your project? Okay, so I'm guessing the people who didn't raise their hands are, haven't actually got a project yet, that's fine. Um, I'll cover that as well. So um, my project covers all three of those categories. Um, it is an application of machine learning, which was found through a lot of research, and it's meant for a practical problem. So uh, my title is Context Preserving Facial Anonymization Using Generative Adversarial Networks. I try to make it as complex as I can, just because I, th I think it sounds cool. But essentially, all it is is an application of facial anonymization. So I don't know if that's completely intuitive, but uh, I'll break it down and e explain exactly what that big title means. So um, currently in our society, humans have faces. And normally that's a good thing, but in our recent day and age with everyone having smartphones and very high resolution image capture at their hands, it can lead to some misuses or some inc inconveniences. So because of all these images, it's very trivial to actually run facial recognition on any imagery. And it's very often done in just CCTV cameras or any media. Now, this isn't always bad. It, it may not even affect most of us. But in some cases, it can lead to severe consequences. Like the Hong Kong protests just a few years ago, um, the recognition that was run on fa uh, facial faces in media uh, could lead led to some very se severe consequences for some people. And it isn't always it's something we want to avoid. And it's a breach of privacy if we don't want our faces on there. So how do we currently deal with facial anonymization? Um, I'm, there's more people coming in. I'm just going to recap. Light slides down, yeah. Uh, are you all second years or? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, cool, looks like more people. Um, okay, so quick recap. This is my title. It's to do with facial anonymization. And the current way we do anonymization is through blurring people's faces. So this is like uh, Google Street View or any other, any other media you may have seen. If they wanna hide faces, they just pixelate them. Now this, is in, this isn't really good. Um, it's, it's not a practical way of doing it, in my opinion. So, because we do this, uh, firstly, we lose so much information. Because their identity can't be seen, we also lose all the other information, like what race they are, male or female. Are they happy? Are they sad? There's nothing you can tell from any of these faces. And those are quite important situations. In, um, in Carnegie Mellon, I think, they, in a nursing home, they're currently using CCTV footage on Alzheimer's patients to tr track their behavior and see how their health is going. And this is one of their issues. This is, this is one of the challenges they're facing. 
because they have to blur the faces in the footage they capture for privacy reasons, their analysts can't actually do it very effectively. And this is something I'm trying to deal with. The other issue is they, it just looks bad. Like it ruins the quality of the images. And it isn't very good for raising awareness of very important events. So what do we want? This is, this is my target. We want to have an anonymized image which looks as close to the original. This is the original without being able to figure out who anyone is in the image. Now that's a really hard task because it needs to be very close to the original, but you, can't, you still don't want to be able to recognize them. So how do I solve this? Now, because machine learning is used for recognition, I thought, why not just use that to evade that? So this is my plan, very simple. Make fake faces, which look very human, and then just replace the originals with them. So it, it should ideally look almost the same, but they are all fake, so there's no way we can figure out who they are. So before I, before I tell you what, how I'm doing it, I just need to tell you quickly what a GAN is. That's the generative adversarial part of my title. Now essentially, it's a very clever way of training neural networks. I won't go into details, but the idea is you just, we want to end up with some generator which can generate faces in our case. And it's, it's, this is essentially what makes the faces in our problem. Okay, so to do that, I started off, started off and used NVIDIA's architecture. These are all fake faces I generated. Um, they look very real, and that's good. So, okay, um, step one done. Now we want to anonymize this. So let's replace the faces. They don't look great. Uh, this, was, this is my baseline. This is, uh, this is what I was going to present if everything else failed in my project. Luckily, I have better results. So what's the issue with this one? The issue with this is um, context. So this is the context part of my title. And the issue with the context, what, what does it mean? It means the fake faces have to have all these characteristics, and they have to match the original face we want to replace. Without that, it'll just look terrible, like you saw. And these are just some of them, but these are the most important ones we want to preserve in the fake faces. OK. Now, that's, that, this is a really tricky problem, because um, we can generate faces pretty easily, but there's no easy way to make sure that a fake face has all these characteristics as the original. OK, so this is where my project begins. Um, because mine is a machine learning project, it involved a lot of experimentation. And any of your ML projects will have the same. You will fail a lot, and a lot of stuff just won't work. I ran a bunch of experiments. I'll just show some of the cool results. I won't go into too in depth because I don't think we have time. OK, so this is the first one. This is still style GAN, but um, I'm trying to, in this experiment, I'm trying to just modify it with some noise in the generation algorithm to make faces which look similar, but they are not the original. And you can see as you go down, they're more and more different from the original. But the issue with this approach I did was, if you can see, the, even like the last uh, column, the age has changed. And that was one of the features I want to preserve. So it was hard to control what the fake faces end up like. So I had to scratch this idea. I tried an expression transfer algorithm. And in, you can see a few different results I had. So this, with this, we could gener generate a fake face and then apply the original expression. And we'd have the same, the um, fake faces would end up with the same expression as the original. So if they, they'd be smiling and such. And the third one I tried was something along the lines of transplanting faces, essentially. On the right are the candidate expressions, and on the left are the originals. And you can see kind of what they morphed into. Not great, but these are, this is how experimentation works. Things failed, and I had to evaluate why they failed. And that's what you're going to be doing if you do machine learning projects. So um, this was about when I ended up ended with experimenting with things, and I had to figure out what I had to do to actually solve it. So uh, the first thing you will encounter with any ML project is data. And to make my own custom model, I had to find a good data set. NVIDIA had a good, nice, good data set, which I used. And the method, I won't go into too much detail, but this is kind of what the architectures I used were. But essentially, the first neural network is kind of what I used for the generation part of it. The idea being, we want uh, an image at the output. And that's already, that really matters for this case. 
Um, so, okay, so I started training with my very custom um, network architecture method. I won't describe the details, but this was the result of the first <laughs> approach. Um, it needed more training, basically. It, was, it wasn't complete. There were some interesting results, but it was, it was kind of promising. You can see fake faces, but they were quite weird. There was overfitting with some stuff. I don't know why they all end up with glasses at one point. Oh, yeah, and so this is kind of what I ended up with after my first iteration. On the left is the original face from the data set, and on the right is what the fake synthesized face it generates. The important thing is, because of how my network was designed and how I designed my solution, all the context features I described before are preserved. Age, expression, skin tone, gender, everything else. And it's also a completely synthetic face. The neural network never actually saw the face on the left. So what it's created on the right is a completely fictional creation. So that person does not exist. Yet they look quite similar. So that's kind of a success because that, that meets my objective, a fake face that can't be recognized. There were some, these, these are some more results. These are all stuff which went in my report. It's very, very generalization, works with multiple poses. So it wasn't just one test case that worked, but yeah. So one of the important things about any project is measuring performance. The way I did that was a identity difference. It's how well it's been anonymized. So with my method, if you, so if you apply a, just a basic blur like I showed you, the difference from the original would be something like 0.64. With my method, it's much better. And it's not that, it, it's not that it's better that in anonymization that's important. It's also the quality. So the one on the right is the generated face. With the red and blue dots show you the like, facial landmarks, so the key points of the face. And you can see they've obviously been changed from the original. And that's what the recognition, recognition neural networks see. So if you, run anonym, if you run anonymization and try to detect the new face, it's only going to be a 31% match. Whereas if you, just, if you use the original, that's a 100% match with the original, obviously. So that's how, you, that's how you'd measure how well you did and whether you succeeded with your project. So um, that was kind of by, that was my research and experimentation bit. And then all it was is just uh, software implementation. I make the, all the components. It was just Python. And this is kind of the architecture I used without going into much detail. By the way, this, this, this was the software bit. And um, so I, I, then I ran that algorithm and the entire end-to-end -end on a few um, examples. These weren't perfect because these are quite different from my data set. And it was, it, I don't know how that looks. So there's some distortion. It isn't completely realistic, but it works decently well on end-to-end -end anonymization. So those are faces. On the right, you can see the fake faces. And if you run a facial recognition on the anonymized image, it wouldn't be able to detect any of the people. OK, so before I move on to the other section, do you have any questions about that? Everything I've said was about my project. I'll talk about some more tips. Yeah? How sort of stable is the anonymization? Because if you like, say, have a video of yourself from one person, will the face change a lot? Is it pretty On videos, no. That was one of the extensions I wrote in my further work. Because it doesn't, it will work, but it won't be temporarily consistent because each frame is individual, individually anonymized. So it definitely won't work on video. Okay, so let me talk a bit about how I, what I learned from my experience and what I think will help you with your specific project. This were the, these were the deadlines I was given. Um, so I, you should have time to select your title and um, supervisor. And these are my few tips for what I think you should do. The first thing I think is the most important thing, and I, this is, I think the, like, this will determine your, how you do in your project, is actually selecting it. Those are some quotes from anonymous people uh, I've just seen over the last couple of weeks. Those, those are true, by the way. Um, yeah, pick a good project. Um, make sure it's doable, but useful. I chose a real problem. I, the way I did it was I brainstormed through like 30 different problems I could think of. 
and then I scored them based on those three metrics. And this is, this is the best one I could think of in terms of all those. If you do an actual project, um, you're going to be spending a whole year on it, so make sure it's good. And I'm planning, I'm planning on pitching mine to uh, Warwick Enterprise afterwards, so if you do well, you can actually take it further and maybe make, take it to market and make something out of it. Objectives and metrics, yeah. So mine was research and machine learning. So you, if you do something like that, you need to have a way to measure how well it did. You can't just say it's good. You have to, you have, you have, to have some benchmark. Mine was compared to the basic way of blurring the faces. So you need some kind of metric if it's this kind of project. And... The other thing with machine learning projects is there's very, a lot of uncertainty. A lot of things won't work. Some, from some people I heard their project just did not work by the end of it. So you need to define a baseline, something you can show off even if nothing else works. And um, over the next, I think, um, before you submit your specification, you have time. Prototype with things you have. Uh, pro test out the data. Check if it's actually possible. Because once you submit your title and decide on it, you cannot change it, I think. Uh, progress, yeah. So when you're going to be writing your dissertation, you're going to have to write like 12,000 words at least-ish. So, and you're going to, you won't be able to think of words then. So may, uh, track your progress over like a week or so and just write down, take screenshots of stuff you've done. It's much easier that way. And that's about it for me. There's, uh, I think I've tried to cover everything in 18 minutes. And so what questions do you have? <laughs> yeah. Supervisor, yes. Um, yeah, I should have covered that. That's a really good thing, actually. It is almost as equally important as um, picking a project. Uh, supervisors, I would. Uh, some people have actually contacted me and others about the supervisor. It's one of the easiest ways to get a honest feedback. I would. Uh, so there's two ways. I think. Look at the projects list and the supervisor's expertise. If it aligns, then they can have help you a lot. That's one thing. And the second is how they are actually with their like actual, how good, good they are with communicating and how much help they'll provide. That you can only find out from asking others, I'd say. Um, I would, some supervisors aren't great, they don't help, but some are really great. So that's really important, actually. Yeah? I have not thought about that um, because well, I've already done it, so I need to look at that soon which is also one of the reasons I haven't gone further and tried to publish it or actually give anyone my actual implementation. But I don't think they will. I hope not, at least. Yeah? I had some experience, so I, so the way I did it was I set different benchmarks and each with a different level of difficulty. And I even said that in my actual specification, saying this is the minimum and this is the hardest. And I, uh, the way I figured out how hard it would be was just prototyping. Before actually writing, um, I, I, I would honestly try to make your baseline before you submit your specification so you have an idea. Some people didn't, and I don't know if their project works. But I would definitely do that. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think that's everything from me. Thank you. I'll pass it to Keegan. All right. Thanks very much. That was a really good talk. Um, now I have to remember who is supposed to be going second. Uh, <laughs> huh? To fix the issues. What, what issue happened? Uh, we have sound in one ear only. What? Yeah. Sound in one ear only. Yeah. That's a new one. Yeah. Okay. I'll
Um, for those who have seen the list of clocks, which one impressed you the most, if you have one? <laughs> okay. I think it's only going to pick up one right. That's one, fine. One spider. Yeah. Oh, actually. Oh, yeah, mm. I'm going to have to. Is this okay, yeah. You, um, it's this. And then you, if you want audio, you put this in. But I mean, no, I don't, no, you know, I don't need audio. Um, one second. I do not remember how to. And then we need to plug in. This, this, this one's not. There we go. This one. Um. Uh -huh. Do you know how to make it project? Because I don't think it's doing it right. What from here to yeah. uh? Actually, no. no. It should do it. It should do it automatically. It should no? do it automatically. So. Okay. Because it's like. Test. Okay, it is on. Thank you. Ah, it's fine. It's fine. All right. Hello, everyone. How close should this be, by the way? Like this close? This close? How close should the mic be? Like this? It's fine. Okay. Cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so for my presentation, I'm pretty much going to show uh, what I did for the actual presentation. Even though my project's finished now, I'm going to act like oh. I'm still working on it, blah, 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 as if like, I'm at that pr pr presentation stage. Um, just so you can kind of see like, sort of what it would look like at that point if you haven't finished yet. Um, also, I'm going to preface, pr preface this by saying uh, I haven't done this presentation in a long time, so I'm probably going to wing it a little bit. That's fine. And also, so obviously make sure you're more prepared when you're doing a your real one. But also, um, you might notice my project isn't really that important. Actually, it's like not really that useful at all. Like, 
you know, you had Avide come in here with his like <laughs> insane um, ethical stuff like that. No, mine is nothing like that. It's it's more of like a passion project. So I'm I'm pointing that out because really, uh, you can kind of make your project on whatever you want. It doesn't have to be too groundbreaking as long as it's something that you can, as Avide pointed out, uh, write about. Anyway, so. My project is about improving typing speed by identifying common mistakes and slowdowns. Now, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I love, or at least used to, uh, love competitive speed typing. Uh, I've, I, in the past, I've been in many speed typing competitions. Uh, and in 2020, I was part of the Ultimate Typing Championship, where I placed third in the world. Um, I also this year hosted the UK's first ever in-person typing tournament. It was actually in the eSports Center in Warwick. Um, like, that was pretty cool. I had the top 24 people in the UK come in to, uh, to type. Um, so yeah, I guess it is a bit of a flex, you know, talking about my time speed or whatever, but I'm just saying this to, to point out to everyone that I'm, like, I'm passionate about this, right? So, yeah, pretty fun passion, there we go. So, Imagine, I want, you, or you, I want you to imagine for a sec that you're a football player, okay, and you work for a team, and your coach comes and tells you, uh, no, no, actually, and, sorry, you find out you're bad at penalty kicks, but your coach tells you to keep practicing everything you do, you know, not just penalty kicks. That's not really a feasible way of improving. You want to focus in on those bad penalty kicks, right? So what if we could apply this to uh, typing tests? You know, every typing test, I'm sure many of you have been on monkey type before, but all the words are random. You know, there's no, there's no basis of like where you struggle, blah, blah, blah. So what if we could find a way to uh, uh, identify your weaknesses, where, you're, where you struggle at when you're typing? Um, so let's take a look at these two words for a sec. We have the word unstoppable and the word cats. Well, as I'm, I'm sure it's like no surprise, but cats is way easier to type than unstoppable. And the reason I point this out is because we don't care if we're slow at the word unstoppable or if we make mistakes on the word unstoppable. We worry if we make more mistakes on unstoppable than the average user. And the same thing applies for cats, you know? If someone's making typing unstoppable, like, sorry, if the world population it sucks at the, the word unstoppable, it's not a big deal if you suck at it as well. Just making sure that you're not, you're not as bad as other people. Um, so how does this work? Well, essentially, Every word can be divided into morphemes, which are essentially patterns. You know, as you're typing on a keyboard, it's all just muscle memory. So we want to hone on that muscle memory, right? Um, so there are many ways to split up words. You know, you can do them through bigraphs or trigraphs, which are just like pairs of two characters, pairs of three characters. Which are, um, but for the sake of this project, I decided to also go through uh, morphemes using morphological parsing, essentially uh, to sort of split words into ways that humans would see. And I'll go into why it's important in a moment. So what is a morpheme? Well, it's the smallest unit of language. So if we look at the word unhappily, we have un, which is the prefix, hap, like happy, the, the middle part is the actual adjective part, and then li, which is the adjective, adjective part, the, the, the suffix, I guess. I, I've forgotten how to describe it anyway. <laughs> you know, but there, there is some ambiguity when it comes to this, right? How do, you, how do you split the words deceive or conceive or whatever? That if you split them up, they're not really they don't really have meaningful, uh, they don't have meanings when you split them up. But we could, when we're spelling them, we could use that sort of technique to spell them more accurately or to type them better. Um, so breaking down these patterns helps us to learn faster and to generalize. Think of the word statistically. You know, when you, when you want to spell this, you might break it down in your head. Stat is tick ali. Or maybe you might break it into three. Instead, you might say stat iste kali. You know, it all depends on the person. So instead of, uh, instead, of using, sorry, instead of finding words that people struggle on, what if we could find morphemes? And by using these morphemes, we can then generate words that contain morphemes you're, you're bad at and uh, suggest words in the typing test that contain those words, which will essentially, morphemes, sorry, which will essentially uh, help you to practice that. Apologies, I am stuttering a bit. Anyway. So there's going to be a four-step process to this. We have the first part is data collection. So TypeRacer, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, is a huge, huge typing, uh, competitive typing website. And luckily for us, the, data, the, the API for, that, uh, for their whole like, data set is public. So if we can find a way to scrape the data and find out what the global average is for each word and, what's that and whatnot, that, that's, that gives us a population, essentially. 
Then our data analysis will be the second part of the project where we'll use this uh, past data from the TypeRacer API to find out um, like people's performances and times on these morphemes. Then we'll have word suggestion. So this will be for the typing test. How do we decide what words to give to the user finding, when we find out what morphemes people struggle with? And finally, evaluation. Um, just evaluating the project, I suppose. Um, so it's a quick demo here. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm not gonna do too much thing, but what I wanna show you is a page on TypeRacer. Wow, that is really big. A page on TypeRacer. So this is called a race replay, and it shows you the details of the race that's, that's like happened in, in the past, I guess. Um, and in this specific one, this user has gotten 200 words per minute on this quote, and you can see if you scroll down, there's this race replay section, and if you press play, it shows like the full input of what they've done throughout the whole race. Right, and this is really really useful because it means that TypeRacer stores the typing log, the like of each word of each of each sentence. We can actually access this. It's in the page source for some reason because TypeRacer is super old. So if we uh, let's right click, if we open the page source and we do a quick, uh, that's not Control F, the typing log, typing with one hand. Sorry, here it is. This here in the HTML code is a short script tag containing JavaScript, and this whole string, this massive string, is a typing log. And that's every input the user made during the race. Um, so what I've done is I've written a script in Python, which will just, uh, it's not this one. I can take, a, I can take any person's um, username on TypeRacer. Who here has a TypeRacer account, actually? Anyone? Really, no one has a typewriter account. That is very impressive. Okay. I thought we were all computer science students. Damn. No problem. I'll just go down here randomly. This guy, Riley. So I'm going to take his name. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I have a script which will scrape all of his data, pretty much, from typewriter. It should work, hopefully. There we go. So right now, it's just pulling all the replays. Uh, I don't know how many this guy's got. I hope not too many. Let me just check. Okay, he's got 3,000. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, so pretty much now, now that it's scraped all of it, um, I'm the whole, uh, this next process, once it's all been scraped, is I'm just processing it. Uh, the problem is about the TypeRacer API is it has uh, API throttling, so you can only do like one iteration per two seconds. It's really stupid. Anyway, so this is just a quick demo showing the, the script working in the background, which I left on for a very long time over many, many users to get the data I needed. That's not responsible. Anyway. Um, okay. What's this part? Probably not important. Okay. Yeah. So, in order to achieve morphological parsing, we didn't really want to be fully accurate because uh, morphological parsing is a big uh, aspect of natural language processing. And it didn't really matter for us if we were too correct. For example, the word forward, it doesn't really make sense to split it into for and would, but for the sake of the like, human, how, how would human break this, humans break this word down? That's probably how they do it, right? So um, we just wanted to achieve something similar. So in order to do this, we use what's called Zip's Law. Um, essentially, Zip's Law tells us that the nth most frequent word in the language is proportional to like, 1 over k. So it's an inverse, uh, inverse proportion? reciprocal, sorry, it's reciprocal um, correlation. As you can see, if you look at this graph of Romeo and Juliet. Oh, sorry. Sorry, what on earth is going on? Sorry. Um, yeah, pretty clear. You have the and, of the, and it goes on and so forth. Um, so to achieve this, we used, I just used a, a text file of, like, uh, of the most frequent words in each language from, from the most frequent onwards, so the, of, in, uh, and, and so, so forth. And this neat little algorithm, by using a cost dictionary to pretty much infer where the spaces would go, um, we, oh man, I totally forgot how to explain this from back in the day. Either way, there's an alg is, uh, <laughs> I developed an algorithm which would infer the spaces using dynamic programming um, by using this like Zip's law frequency for a cost dictionary. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm realizing I'm running out of time now. I wasn't as fast as this before. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. So, 
I have my data in my database now. That's cool. As you can see, I've got the each replacer up there with the typing log, which I've passed, um, and then some. And for, since I've analyzed all the morphemes, I can I can see how many errors a user's made on a morpheme, or how many how long they took to type the morpheme, which is pretty much what we need. Finally, um, we want to actually analyze this whole population, right? So, for the sake of this, uh, we have two. Uh, metrics that I've come up with are pretty simple. The first is accuracy for a morpheme. Pretty much just the correct attempts divided by the total attempts that the, the user's done on a morpheme. And the performance, which is a bit more convoluted, but essentially it's how fast a user types the word compared to the average words per minute. So if you, have a more, if you have a performance of two on the word cats, it means if your words per minute is 100, then you've typed cats at 200 words per minute. Um, so let's take a look at Bob here, who's typed the word ward with accuracy 0 0.75 and a performance of 1.5. So this is an individual, uh, uh, met, these are the indiv individual accuracy and performance, this is just for Bob. For the average population, which we have from that massive data set that, that I've just got by scraping type race and analyzing data, we find that ward is on average, has an accuracy of 0 0.9 and a performance of 1.75. So it's pretty clear that by both metrics, Bob is struggling on this word ward. Um, so at this point, the only thing that we have left is to f uh, find words that contain, so have a massive list of words which will have, uh, which are split into its morphemes, and then also a list of morphemes which will be split into what words contain them. <sighs> okay, and then, um, I was supposed to demo here, but a too long setup, so it doesn't matter. But um, once we've been able to find what the what morphemes users struggle on, and we are able to find out what words contain them. Then we can just suggest them to the user. Um, yeah, I'll just skip the section because I'm running out of time now. But pretty much, uh, my future goals for this project would be, I suppose they're done now. But but uh, what they would be at the point of this uh, presentation, at the time of the presentation, would be. So I'd like to store the user data from Monkey Type. Because since monkey type is the main typing test that I'm using in order to, it's my main front end, I'd like to use their logging system as well to sort of expand my database as people use the application. I'd like to conduct a study to actually find out is doing this method of uh, type test training any more different than just doing random test training, you know? Uh, so, and then finally, a lot of my code is very, very modular, which means I can optimize certain aspects um, or certain modules. Uh, anytime I want, and it won't really affect the rest of the program, uh, so I can optimize if I need be. So I'd like to experiment with that and uh, see what I can come up with. Okay, I think I made it on time. Yeah, sorry, that was a really rough presentation, but <laughs> like I said, I haven't done it in a long time. Um, I suppose, yeah, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, the whole idea is that it's going to be well, it is uh, self-tailored. So the program will know. Will have your, if you type for long enough, the program will know what words or what and what morphemes that you are struggling on compared to the rest of the population. And then from that, I haven't actually made it so you, the user can see the list. But if they wanted to see the list, yeah, you know, I, I could add that as a thing. But the typing test will give it gives you pretty much. Like I said, there's supposed to be a demo here, but I haven't got it. But um, it gives you, when you're doing the whole, whole test, it will give you words that you suck at, basically. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes, you there. Yeah, so I did consider things like, uh, I, well, at the time, because obviously for the point of the project, you have to write down ethical considerations, stuff like that. Um, I was looking up GDPR and uh, other related rules. Turns out, um, Typeracer doesn't store or doesn't publicly provide any personal information. Um, so pretty much when I was scraping, the only things I was getting was their username, like their race details, like what position they got in the race and then what uh, their speed was, blah, 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 and then obviously the typing log. And so there was no like public information that I could like uh, pretty much Sorry, there's no private information that I could get publicly, so I didn't have to worry about sort of that aspect. Um, especially because I don't store any private information either. It's literally just username and then typing data, which yeah, doesn't really follow any uh, 
ethical concerns or anything like that. Thank you. Thanks for the question there. Yes. How long does it take you to write your code? Like, I think it's three minutes to write your code. See, that's the thing. Uh, I type fast, but my brain doesn't think as fast as I type. So, yeah, the benefit of, uh, uh, here's the thing for anyone that actually cares about typing fast. Once you get to like 100 words a minute, you're pretty much set. You don't need to get any faster. It's pretty much like uh, diminishing returns from that point. Um, because at that point, yeah, like I said, when you're writing reports or something, unless you're like thinking at 200 words a minute, which I don't know who, who is really, it's not that beneficial. Uh, it's just for the fun, really. Yeah, thanks for the question. Anyone else? Yes, hello. Yeah, so that's a really, really good point. And something I haven't touched on here, but I did touch on in my report. So this program is only, and I say it's only useful, provided you know how to touch type. If you don't know how to touch type, the data, it just doesn't apply at all. There's, um, when I was going through, uh, when I was actually studying the accuracy and the performance metrics of the population data, I found that so before, like, pretty much according to my hypothesis, which was that like, some morphemes are harder than others, right? That's a pretty standard hypothesis. But when I was uh, testing it, like for example, the word cats, if it has a population one, uh, sorry, if it has a uh, performance of 1.5, it only applies past like 60 words per minute. And that's, so if you're six words per minute, you're gonna type that at 1.5 times 60 words per minute. And that is very, very constant uh, looking at the data. A lot of this project was actually data science, but if you don't know how to touch type, then none of this applies. Uh, you kind of have to just get to a certain point until this actually matters. Um, and th this whole program was designed for people who already know how to touch type anyway. For people who don't, uh, I, I offer the alternatives in, in the report and also I offer to you guys, if you don't know how to touch type, I would highly, highly recommend, uh, it's called keybr.com, this one. This is a great website to learn how. If you already know how, it's useless. Anyway, thank you, thank you for the question. I think I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Jesus. I Ooh, one final question. Yeah. Um, you know uh, when you like do the when you compute an average, why do you add one to the top and two to the bottom? Yeah, so sorry, I'm just oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Um there's a thing called La Laplace's rule of succession. Uh, I didn't it was in the presentation, I didn't cover it here because just to save time, but um, essentially, what, what Keegan's talking about is this right here. For the accuracy, I've actually added one and to, to the numerator and two to the denominator. Uh, this is because um, some users would have typed morphemes a lot less than others. So to compensate for, so pretty much like imagine you typed the morpheme twice and you got them right twice. That's 100% accuracy. It's like, or even maybe you've typed them both wrong, it's 0% accuracy. Even though, like, these numbers are way too extreme. So essentially, by using the rule of succession, um, you can better uh, weigh, how do I say this? It, it makes the people with less uh, attempts at morphemes, they have less of an impact on the averages overall. This is some data science stuff, uh, which I've mostly forgotten now, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the question, Keegan. Okay, we'll just start with the next talk now. Uh, yeah. uh, I assume there's a, um, I should I just mute the mic here? What do we need?
Yeah. I think we should be good to start. Okay. There you go. Hi guys. Hope you. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm James, um, uh, and my project was a security analysis of algorithms that hash two elliptic curves. So um, I know that you've and probably seen and will see some more um, presentations. So I was thinking I'd start off with just some um, advice. And actually, I wonder if I can. Okay, that's not going to work. Uh, and can I extend? Hopefully. Or is that not going to work? <laughs> okay, sure. Okay. Hopefully it's. Uh, can you remember without the notes? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, yeah. Um, Oh, sorry if I missed out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right, nice, sorry. Yeah, okay. So um, I was just um, going to give some um, general oral advice for um, projects. So I found it really hard to actually think of a um, project idea. I knew what sort of things I was um, interested in, and that was really um, cryptography. Um, so I just talked to some um, supervisors and I would really recommend that. And um, um, because uh, even though I knew what sort of things I was um, interested in, I had no idea what sort of um, um, problems there were in that area that um, could um, be solved. So, th so th 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 that that's why speaking to a supervisor is really helpful. Um, um, because they know uh, all of the um, current and problems in the the area, and um, and so uh, so um, my um, supervisor, as you can see, is was uh, was Feng Hao, and um, he just um, happened to um, come across a problem in some. Um, Existing hash to curve algorithms, and and uh, he had just been um, emailing another uh, academic about them, and then um, he s suggested it to me as a um, a possible third year um, project idea, and it sounded um, perfect. So so just um, talk to. Um, supervisors if you're not sure what um, to do and also you are in control of your project and you, you can really um, <laughs> mold it to be more um, programming or more um, or a more research and project so I I did like the sound of a a research and project, and so I have some parts of that there. Although to kind of hedge your um, pets, uh, and you can start with some um, pro some um, programming. Try the uh, the research, and if that and doesn't quite work out, then uh, and sh then and sh you still have the um, programming. Uh, Okay, so I'll start by um, sh by um, explaining a little bit of my project, and it's really about can we do cryptography with um, passwords? So we like um, <laughs> using passwords. We use passwords in all things that we do. So we want and to do cryptography with them. And new and cryptography is done on elliptic curves. So we want to to and to turn your password into a point on an elliptic curve, and then uh, we need to do and cryptography with it. So we first look at um, opaque, which is a a an cryptographic protocol for exchanging. Um, and keys, which um, e which 
He uses your um, password to ensure that you are talking to the right um, person. But the really cool thing about Opaque is that it and does not actually send the password. And um, to do that, it uses hash to curve algorithms. So I will not and go through all of the project, but um, uh, th this is what opaque is, and it has and it got two stages. Um, it's got re registration and then um, login, and um, and th th these are all of the messages sent in each stage. Um, so my uh, and c contribution was I extended an existing um, implementation of opaque. Um, and here is a quick um, demo of how my my <laughs> well, my interface works. So, so it's just like a like a, uh, like a, a web um, program, and, and you, you can register, and it shows clearly everything that is sent, so that. Um, you can understand how the um, protocol works, uh, and then you can log in with that same username and password. And I've got a few more um, um, edge cases. So if uh, and you, you try and um, and register with the same username again, for example, then that does not work. Um, okay, and then um, more was that I also found some uh, um, problems in the existing uh, um, proof of, of concept of opaque, and I sorted um, uh, those out, and and th and then so so really th this and turned into something quite cool that I have to um, show for my my project is that. I, I have kind of, um, I've um, found some problems in things that um, real cryptographers uh, have and done. Okay, so now we get into elliptic curves. I won't um, bore you with exactly what elliptic curves are, um, but then the uh, actual um, hash to curve algorithms and how they work. Um, and so there's a problem which my um, my super supervisor spotted and I was trying to fix it. And uh, I found some, ex some existing algorithms that um, and tried to solve it. And I worked out that you can extend them to solve solve this um, unsolved problem. Um, and so I did actually uh, solve sort of um, sort of <laughs> this problem. So that um, worked out to be the, 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 the kind of the, the actual. Um, or a research um, side of my project, and I was not sure if that would actually work for quite a long time, so I was just um, hoping to stick with the um, programming. But after the um, presentation, I did actually um, get that to work, and uh, yeah, it, it did work quite well. So then a bit on, uh, on project management and um, conclusions, so I did actually do um yeah that's that's it really uh, uh so i'm so sorry that that was quite um quick and because it's not the full um presentation um but i hope that um it gives you an overview of the project and some advice for trying to find um uh what you want and to do your project on so and uh, and um, if you've uh, and caught any questions that you don't want and to ask me now, I'm sure um, you can f um, 
and and get hold of me somehow, and uh, I'll be happy to answer. I'm door door. I'll stay um, near p p by after w after woods as well. So, but, but um, for now, have you got any questions, anyone? Um, yes. Well, uh, I always really like encryptography, so that w that um, was always my plan. Um, but I did. But um, the uh, the supervisor that I ended up with in th in the, the, the end was not the first supervisor <laughs> that I s I um, spoke to, but he really um, and and came up with the main idea for the project, um, and that was w w why I chose him, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so um, I would, would say if, um, if y y you know roughly what sort of a project you want and to do, but you're not sure on an actual idea, um, or uh, you're not sure what sort of things will actually work, then just talk to um, to supervise, and I'm sure that they can help, yeah. Has that um, answered your question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Uh, can't see. Anyone else? No? Okay, no, no problem. Uh, um, f f f yeah, so, um, but if you, um, if you do have... Um, any more, I'll stay around um, nearby for a few m <laughs> minutes afterwards, and if not, you, you, you can, I'm sure you can f um, somehow find me. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hope it's helpful. <laughs> oh, I need to get my USB back. What's it? What's it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably should get USB back. Uh, thanks very much. Cheers. Uh, right. Uh, I think now we have, uh, we have Aiden. Yes. Um, and then after this talk, we'll just do a brief intermission, uh, just while we get some stuff set up, and also to give you guys, you know, the actual opportunity to go to the toilet. Right. We've got some. Oh, yes, we do. You need some too. You need to plug your thing to here. Show right. Let's give a good start. Right. <laughs> right, so hi, uh, I'm Aidan. Uh, you've probably been told that you're expecting a talk on analyzing FPS deathmatch maps using machine learning, and that is what this talk is about. Uh, but it's also a bit of a case study into a sort of typical third year machine learning project uh, because my project, the actual results were not that successful. Uh, and that just happens sometimes, and so I'm actually going to go into sort of why that might happen and some of the problems that can occur along the way. Um, so, 
firstly, you know, what actually is machine learning? There's actually loads of different areas to machine learning. So if you're doing a machine learning project, they're not all going to be the same. So obviously, some of the things I say might not apply to you, but um, I'm going to try to keep it pretty broad anyway um, and try to sort of demonstrate through my project some of the key things that might be worth bearing in mind. Um, so what was my project? It was uh, the catch be titled Analyzing FPS Deathmatch Maps Using Machine Learning, um, in which I set out to attempt to use a neural network to create a metric for rating maps in FPS games, uh, with the future goal of potentially using this in procedural generation of maps. Um, I completed this project within the open source engine Cube2 and sort of benefited from the reasonably small but dedicated level design community around that game. Um, so, you know, you want to do an ML project. Firstly, why? Um, <laughs> it's, it seems like a stupid question, but honestly, it's worth bearing in mind bec before you fall for like the buzzword of machine learning. There could be other approaches. You know, do you need machine learning to solve this problem, or are there alternatives that could potentially be better? Uh, in my case, when I was looking at the generation approach, uh, there's actually already some existing approaches, such as one which is quite a practical tool, which only partially automates the generation, doesn't use machine learning at all. Um, but in order to actually solve sort of more uh, machine learning based procedure generation, I thought it was a good idea to look into this uh, development of a metric uh, to rate maps. Um, so, yeah, you know. Before you start, you do want to manage your expectations um, because are you going to discover some new groundbreaking results? Probably not. Uh, is machine learning going to perfectly solve whatever task you give to it, uh, despite what we know about Skynet? No, probably not. Um, and is machine learning the easy option for your third year project? Um, I mean, it, it, it still can be, uh, but not, not always, not always. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the first part of your machine learning project is going to be data collection. And uh, it's the very first stage of any machine learning project. So, you know, what do we do? Do we just Google, uh, grab the first data set that comes up? Um, no, do not do that. Uh, in my opinion, your data is the most important part of your machine learning project. Um, there are a lot of things to bear in mind here which can cause problems further down the line. So be very careful when picking your data. Yeah, so here's some good points to consider. You know, firstly, is there enough data? Machine learning models can require a large amount of data to begin to produce any useful results, especially for some more complex tasks. Uh, so that's definitely good to bear in mind. Uh, is the data accurate? So in my case, I was using user ratings for maps uh, in order to create a, net, a network that could predict new user ratings. Um, but were these ratings really that accurate? I'm trying to look at the level design of the maps, but the people that have rated these maps might have rated them on how they look. Uh, they, you know, their ratings might not even be that trustworthy, so you have to put some consideration to this stuff as well. Um, is the data well distributed? Now, this was a particular problem in my uh, project um, because it's very important to have a good range of your data showing sort of the full range of values. Uh, so you want some really bad maps, you want some really good maps. Of course, the problem is when you're uh, extracting maps from an existing mapping site, people aren't going to be uploading really shit maps. Uh, the vast majority of the maps I got were rated around the four star mark, uh, and that caused a huge bias in the data, uh, which was quite hard to deal with. Um, and so th stuff like that is definitely worth bearing in mind for any projects. Uh, and then finally, you know, can you even access the data? Um, sometimes data is not that easy to actually get your hands on. You know, it's not as simple as just downloading a data set. You might need to scrape some websites or do all manner of things. You might need permission to get the data. There's lots of things to consider there. Uh, and so, you know, let's move on to machine learning. We've got our big back box of machine learning magic. We've got our perfect data set. We're going to shove it in and see what happens. Yeah, so unfortunately that didn't work. Uh, first, we're going to have to process our data because your data is almost never going to be available in immediately usable format. In fact, the vast majority of my project, and I think a lot of machine learning projects, is actually processing your data before you actually use it in your uh, networks. Um, in my case, I was met with walls of binary text uh, that required a whole lot of interpreting and trimming of unnecessary data that I didn't want uh, 
in order to get it into a nice format that I could actually use. Um, so that's an example of a map that I looked at. Um, and so, but even when you have got the data into a more understood format, there still might be more work to do because you might have multiple components in your data. In my case, I extracted uh, the geometry from map files. I extracted all the entities on the map, like spawns and weapons. Uh, I even extracted heat maps from simulated matches. Now, combining all these features together is actually quite difficult because some of this was stored as arrays, some of it, uh, the geometry was an octree. Um, we also had uh, all the entities as coordinates with different attributes. Combining this all together is quite difficult, and you do need to be consistent when working with neural networks. Uh, so you need to consider, is there a consistent size to your data uh, samples as well? Uh, because you want to be able to capture as much data as possible, but with minimal wastage. Uh, for example, um, if I had uh, 50 entities on one map and 500 entities on another, that's not going to work. It needs to be consistent. Um, and also, in some cases, some maps are much bigger than others. So some can be represented by at 1,000 by 1,000 grid. Another can be represented by 500 by 500 grid. Which do we choose? Because we've got to be consistent, but then we're going to leave a lot of empty space for the smaller maps. Um, so there's definitely some considerations there. But let's say we've got our data in a perfectly usable format, and we've got our big black box of machine learning again, and so we'll put it back in and hope for better results this time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's in the box? Because if you're doing a machine learning project, you're actually going to get some insight into what your machine learning model is doing. Uh, part of the joy of doing a machine learning project is we actually get a little bit of insight under the hood and to see what's going on. You know, depending on the nature of your project, you may learn more about this in detail, or you may even try to study exact features of models. Um, in my case, we used an architecture pretty similar to this one. It's pretty nice. Um, <laughs> We extracted all the data, and then we were classifying it afterwards um, with those layers. None of this probably makes sense to you now. If you do the machine learning and neural computing modules, that will probably make a lot more sense. Um, <laughs> but also, good thing to note here is if you didn't look into this uh, before um, formatting your data, um, I'm sorry, but you might have to reformat it all over again uh, because you do need a network that will take, so, you know, networks will only take certain inputs depending on how you make them. Uh, so finally, let's get some results. Uh, let's put our data set into our now well understood bit black box of machine learning. Um, unfortunately, sometimes our results are just a little trash. Um, <laughs> So, you know, one thing to note with machine learning projects is there's always going to be more tweaking you can do. Uh, whether this be attempting to use different models, uh, whether this be tuning hyperparameters, changing your loss functions to assess your accuracy, um, augmenting the data uh, by adding transformations to the data, um, changing the input format itself, maybe changing the resolution of it. Um, and even including stuff such as transfer learning, which involves using existing networks uh, and their weights, which have been trained for similar tasks to help improve your own model. Um, so, finally, we're good to go. Let's get our final results. Um, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes they're still trash. Um, <laughs> the truth is, sometimes failure is inevitable. Uh, perhaps the data is just too complex, there's not enough of it, or there's just not enough meaningful patterns in it. Or maybe your model is just not powerful enough. Maybe the technology that's needed to solve your problem just hasn't been invented yet. Uh, as I said before, machine learning will not solve everything. But remember, your third year project is a chance to learn and explore new areas of this subject that interest you. So make the most of that. I learned a huge amount from my project, and though it was challenging, it was a really quite fun process throughout, and ultimately, uh, although at this stage, uh, with the current available data, I don't think it's quite possible to create a very good metric for assessing um, and analyzing FPS maps. Uh, I think it could definitely be done in the future, and I'd be looking forward to see what people do with it. Um, so, sorry if you came to this talk expecting to be wowed by wonderful results, um, but unfortunately, that's just not the case today. Um, so, in summary, don't do an ML project just because everyone else does. Uh, 
data is key. I am a little disappointed with my results, but I would say my project's a success anyway. And hopefully, I'll still get a first. Please give me marks, Greg. <laughs> um, so, any questions? <laughs> Good question up there. I have a question. Then. I'm unsure whether, like, you do have to answer it or whether Greg would be better at answering it. Um, if you do have a project like that, where what your like hypothesised get as results doesn't actually happen, like, could that just completely like screw you over? Or as long as you like still write a good report on it, would you still like be able to say good enough? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think that's the case at all. I think um, on his, in. In general, this was really a research project. It was researching how well machine learning could be applied to this situation. If machine learning couldn't be applied that well, that's not entirely my fault. Um, if, if the data's just not there, if it's just too complex a task, uh, that's just the case sometimes. But I still did a lot of work in the project, produced a lot of uh, clear, you know, showing off technical content. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And if you can sort of talk about that, justify that, explain why your project might have failed or uh, what could potentially be improved in the future, you know, you're well on your way to getting a good mark there because you're, you're sort of showing everything you want to show. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's definitely some other approaches you could take here. I think really it needs better data. Um, but um, I think ha uh, heat maps were something I added sort of midway through my project. Uh, but they're definitely something I would look at more in the future and generating more of. Because you can generate multiple for each map and that allows you to get a bit more data. Um, but... Uh, you could also consider different systems. I've had numerous people suggest uh, CSGO to me. Um, there's problems with that. There are reasons why I didn't choose CSGO. I did look at it, I promise. Um, <laughs> but um, definitely there is potential there as well. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I think this, there's definitely more work to be done here. Uh, yeah. Uh, not particularly, and that's that's part of the the problem with it. That's you know that's really where the project didn't quite succeed, um, because um, if the if the neural network couldn't decide what a good map was, I couldn't really look into a, what the neural network was doing to see what it was actually deciding. Uh, but it's it's definitely clear there's a lot of subjective debating ideas in the industry about sort of what makes a good map, which is why this project was sort of considered, uh, because there is. Uh, in some existing generation approaches I looked at, people were using their own metrics that they purely defined um, based on just sort of common level design principles and using that to assess the maps. Um, but that turned out to not be that effective. Um, and in fact, some of the maps that were being rated highest by their metric were not really rated the highest by actual players. Um, and so it kind of shows that people don't really know for sure what makes a good map, or at least can't sort of put it in any sort of well-categorized way um, and sort of explain it algorithmically. And so, yeah, there's definitely more to be done there. Uh, anyone else? No, I think we're done. take a quick five ten minute break now so uh, if you need a piss really badly then then you can do that uh, and then we'll be back with uh, three final talks okay
So the plan is to uh, to start back up at 25 past, which should be in about three minutes. So, uh, it's approaching 25 past, so I think we'll uh, probably start in a minute. Okay, intermission is over. Uh, I'll go and start the talk uh, now. Guys. Okay, cheers. <laughs> right. So, uh, my project, um, as opposed to all the previous projects, somehow manages to be even more useless than the others. Uh, yeah, so, uh, are there any discrete mathematicians in the room? One, two. Two? Oh, don't boo us. Yeah, um, so um, while you will probably, well, the rest of you will probably do something that is actually useful, uh, we will instead study abstract problems that may or may not be useful. We don't know yet. Um, so <laughs> my slide deck is mostly left intact, uh, but I'll be covering it in a slightly different way uh, as we go through. Uh, and also, hi, I'm Keegan. I'm a third year discrete math student, uh, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> okay, so um, obviously some of these things can be complex, so let's start pretty simple. So here's an introduction. Um, now, uh, is, is the mouse on the screen again? Come on, guys. Right. Um, I assume that, you know, pretty much all of you have heard of tic-tac-toe. That, that's pretty simple, right? You know, uh, everyone, two players, each one has a symbol, and you take it in terms of place it down. Uh, and uh, you have a bunch of different 
uh, lines that you can form with it. So you needed to go form three in a row, whether that's horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. And you'd be the first person to do that. Uh, but instead, my project is less concerned with you know, the entire game of tic-tac-toe, and more interested in the, uh, what if we care less about the grid and more about the lines that were formed on the grid? Um, so what if, we wanted to, what if we hated all the players and wanted to prevent any of them from being able to place down uh, a three in a row in the first place? Uh, so in other words, uh, what is the minimum number of squares on the board that we need to block uh, to ensure that it's impossible to form a three in a row to begin with? Uh, so uh, in this case, it, uh, here is one solution. It, it's three squares. Uh, now, question is, uh, is this the minimum? Uh, this is what we call an N equal to three case. Uh, and another way to reframe the problem is um, there must be at least one square in each row, at least one square in each column, and at least one square in each diagonal. So immediately you can see that, well, we have to have at least three, or at least n in the n case. Um, so that means that this is optimal, yay. Uh, what about higher n's? Because uh, obviously we like generalization. Uh, well, for n equal to five, oh, we can form this nice diagonal pattern here. Uh, for n equal, to seven, uh, n equal to nine, we can form this nice diagonal pattern here. Uh, so you can see that for all odd n, uh, we can just form this diagonal uh, thing up here, nice and simple. Uh, if we want to block an n equal to six grid, well, yeah, we just put a diagonal up here. Oh, but wait, no, it doesn't quite work because we've got this diagonal line uh, of, of six that's going through. Uh, so in this case, we can just take a simple approach of uh, swapping. So we just swap the two at the corners and make this nice uh, pattern. Yay. Uh, and obviously this is pretty arbitrary, like we can switch these around a little bit, you know, like this or like this. As long as um, you can see that they're, um, as long as you can see that we've blocked the two diagonals at least while keeping one in each row and one in each column. Um, uh, except there is one case, one awkward case, uh, n equal to two. Because well, no matter how much we flip it, we can't really solve the problem, so we have to block three. Uh, so that leaves us with this nice, uh, you know, nice formula, uh, three if n equal to two, uh, and then otherwise. Now, you may have noticed something. Um, you see how I call it B, N, N? Uh, and that's the thing. Well, we, I don't think we've generalized this problem enough. Uh, we need to, what if instead, uh, we treated the side length of the grid independent to the, side length, uh, to the size of the train, of the chain that we want to block? So, um, this is where we get to, uh, we have B, uh, and this is where the real problem comes in. So more formally, uh, because you know we have to state it more formally, uh, we let uh, a blocking grid, we let n greater than one be the side length of the discrete uniform grid, it's just a grid. Uh, unless specified, the grid will size the n by n, that's so two dimensions, uh, and each grid square can be one of two states, blocked or unblocked, nice and simple. Um, now a k chain, um, we're gonna call it a sequence of k greater than one, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally adjacent squares on this grid. Uh, on a blocking grid, uh, a K chain is blocked if there's a blocked square on that chain. And a blocking grid is a valid tiling if all possible K chains are blocked on the grid. Uh, so if I get my pin out here, nice and fancy, uh, if I, uh, you know, if I block, like say if it was a four chain, five by five, that would be horizontal. Uh, here's one that's, uh, that happens to be diagonal. Uh, and here's one that happens to be vertical. These are, all, these are all K chains. Uh, and we let B and K be the minimum number of block squares needed such that no K chains exist. Uh, now, nice, the, the thing that you do when you have a math problem is you try and get out the trivial cases first. So trivial case number one, uh, K, equal to, K equal to one, uh, we block everything. Um, if K is greater than N, we'd block nothing because you know, there's, there's not gonna be any K plus one, uh, there's not gonna be any like, N plus one chain here, it'll be too big, it won't fit. Uh, if I have K equal to two, well, uh, each unblocked square must be surrounded by eight block squares. Uh, however, we can shift things around a little bit and put them in the corners. So we end up with this nice tiling here. Uh, in general, the idea is to take this two by two pattern and just plaster it over the grid. Um, and yeah, it, it's pretty visual. You can, you can somewhat intuit this. Um, the equation isn't as nice, but it's fine, we'll move on. Um, what if k is equal to n? Well, um, well, if we take a solution for k is equal to n, um, and note that at least one square in, in each row column down is supposed to be blocked, that was as before, and we see that um, at least one of these squares must lie in the leftmost column. So all the squares to the right of this are gonna form a chain length n minus one. And what that means 
is that there must be at least n plus one block squares if we make it k equal to n minus one, right? Which makes sense. And also, it's worth noting that we start having more chains on the diagonals. So now we've got a bunch more to block. Um, and uh, in general, we can show that uh, this equation here holds. And what it means is we need at least a more squares if we reduce k by uh, a from n. And that's pretty simple. We just split it into two sections. And we notice that this means at least a, and this needs at least n squares. But if we had any less, so if we had any less, we'd have a contradiction. Uh, and you can see that we can also uh, make these sort of outer layers, if you will, to make this more obvious, uh, to actually prove that it's uh, a upper bound as well. So I need to plot these diagonals now that I've made this pattern, and um, I, can do, I can do so like that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details too much. This is an, another example. Uh, and uh, it's not so simple to see for some smaller cases. So funnily enough, smaller cases are actually more difficult than large general cases. Uh, and yeah, that's an example where it doesn't work. Uh, so in general, we get this nice formula uh, for all n greater than 6. Now moving on. Uh, if uh, this is for, uh, n is e for k is equal to n minus 2. So you can see that this time we've, made, we've wrapped it around in, a, in sort of a, a layer of three, uh, like a three by three layer, if you will. Uh, and it actually reduces to our original problem for the n equal to k case. So we can just block it like we know how to. So this means that it works for every single uh, n greater than nine, which is nice. Uh, and in general, you can see how this is going to generalize, you know. Um, there must be some function for which, at which point we can use this tiling and it, and it will, we'll find that the lower bound is equal to the upper bound. Uh, okay. Most of the k not nice to calculate exactly. Um, so in general, when we're looking at uh, an algorithmic problem, we have to find a general upper bound or a general lower bound. And in this case, well, this is an obvious lower bound, right? We need to block at least, uh, we, we have a bunch of lines. If we consider only the horizontal direction, then each block line is a length n, and there are n over k block lines. So for every, so k equal to four, so one, two, three, we need to block that. One, two, three, we need to block that. One, two, three, we need to block that, and so on. Um, and an upper bound, uh, well, it's, it's, it, it gives you that value, but you can see like, intuitively what it actually means. We're just making k minus one by k minus one subgrids. Uh, so each block length is of length n. Uh, there are four of n over k block lines in each direction. Uh, and overlapping squares are removed. Um, so what this actually means is if you look at the difference between the two here, it actually creates, I guess, what you'd call a two approximation. So it's going to be like um, only twice as much as this. So we've sort of managed to uh, collapse any, um, any solution between these two bounds. Uh, right. So it's not always entirely obvious whether uh, something that's an upper bound is actually optimal or not. So like these both look optimal. But um, on this one on the right here, I can shift it to the right and move this up. And that's actually much better than the original one. Like, it's not entirely intuitive. Uh, and uh, for if we consider this case here, n equal to 6k equal to 3, well, this is what's given by our upper bound. But, you know, it looks a bit redundant, right? I mean, if, if we just move this around here, like, you can just see the redundancy. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's our actual solution. And you'll notice it looks suspiciously like, um, you know, a Minecraft circle? Yeah. Uh, so is this the minimum? Uh, well, it's a 6 by 6 grid, so there's 36 squares. Uh, there's a known solution of size 16, this one right here. Uh, and we know that if there's a size B solution, well, then there's got to be a size B plus 1 solution, right? I mean, we just take a block square and make another square blocked. It's not going to make anything become unblocked. Um, but what that means in reverse is that if there's no solution, uh, sorry, if there's a solution, if there's no solution of size b minus one, then there's no solution all the way down. It's just the reverse of the statement. Uh, so that is, oh, how many do I have to check here? Ah, five billion. So all I need to do to prove that this is the minimum is check uh, five billion times on an, uh, what sort of algorithm do I need for this? Oh, O n squared algorithm. Sorry, what, what is this again? Oh, six. Oh. Yeah, this isn't going to scale well. Um, so we might need a different approach than just brute forcing. 
Uh, now, the complexity of this problem, determining whether it's the minimum or not, um, is in this, uh, you guys have heard of NP. Uh, Co-NP is like, um, what if instead I could say yes, uh, given a polynomial time certificate, uh, now I can confirm no in a polynomial time certificate. Uh, so in this case, um, I could tell you that no, there is a better minimum by giving you that better minimum. Um, but I can't say no, there isn't, uh, I, can, I can't say uh, yes, this is the minimum without doing a lot more work. Right, uh, these are some related book stuff. Well, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, okay, this is cool. To the best of my knowledge, which means that I've looked at a lot of papers and I cannot find, I, I cannot find a single thing mentioning this. It's so obscure and so useless that nobody's coded it before, which means that I'm technically doing, doing original research. Yay. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of why I want to study it in some ways because it was sort of this little combinatorial puzzle, um, but it, it's not been looked into before. Like that is a gold mine in, in, in research. Uh, so I looked at this guy, he was like, um, I looked at this guy's book, he was like, oh, it's actually, this problem is actually like really hopeless. Um, mathematics gave on the, up on this kind of problem uh, years ago, uh, combinatorial chaos. Uh, we simply have no data available. Uh, it's impossible to search for patterns. Uh, so that's, that's, that's pretty encouraging. Um, okay, uh, let's try and solve it as SAT, right? Uh, you guys know how to encode things as a SAT, right? Right? Uh, you do ha yeah. you, you guys know that you have an exam on this, right? Yeah. Okay, right. So. Uh, this is like a three by three case, and um, if we encode it into SAT, well, uh, we've got these nice constraints up here. We've also got this one where we need it to be equal to B, so we need to have all of the sums of all the squares, uh, so from you know one one to three three. Uh, that's, I need to have exactly B then blocked. Now, um, if you try and express that in a SAT formulation, it's going to look pretty nasty. Uh, so it's mostly Boolean variables, but we've got another, another problem. Uh, so we could let B the target number of squares and decrement B if the solution is found. So we will eventually hone in on the solution um, or find that it'll take ages to run. Um, so instead, we could use one of the available integer programming, uh, like one of the solvers, you know? Um, I mean, does anyone have a solver that I could, I could borrow for, for, for solving SAT? I know anyone made one recently? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's some industrial ones here. Um, I didn't use any of them. I used Google Auto Tools. Uh, and the reason why I used Google Auto Tools uh, was, uh, firstly, Google has a track record of developing really powerful tools across various mediums. Uh, and the second reason is that it won four gold medals in the international, sorry, uh, on the international query and constraint competition. Uh, so, yeah, that's also, an, that's probably a better reason. Uh, I also use Python. Uh, why? Well, I... Uh, one reason I didn't say is because it's much easier to use Python, uh, but also the performance is not impacted by the choice of language. The second that it gets sent to the solver, it's off to C++, and I don't get to see it, so that's fine. Uh, and it also lets me use NumPy and Pillow. Those are nice imaging libraries and matrix libraries. Uh, okay, so the idea is, what if I develop a program, and then I find some patterns, and then I prove some conjectures, of not really difficult ones, but I still prove some conjectures, and then I explore the problem more, and that lets me develop the program more. That seems like a nice cycle. So that's what I ended up doing. Uh, things I tried that didn't really work. Uh, LP rounding, uh, you will encounter this in third year, maybe. Um, it's terrible. Uh, I, the the approach I added was always better. Um, the stochastic local search. So it just means randomizing things until it works. Um, yeah, that didn't really work. And a lot of solvers already do this. And using alternatives to the auto CB SAT. Yeah, they didn't really work. Um, they, it wasn't really beneficial to use anymore. Uh, and here are some results that I found, yay. And the ones that are colored in are the ones that I've already uh, shown you, so that's nice. Uh, and you can see here, uh, you see these two asterisks here, you know, for the, for the n equal to 12k equals three and four case. Uh, that means that I ran it for 24 hours and it didn't return a solution, but this is the lowest it found. Um, so even at n equal to 12, it, it's, not, it's, it's still struggling, even with industrial powered tools, yay. Um, so you can see it's, they're, they're still running. Like, I, I, start, I actually started running them today just to see if they would, you know, well, I say today. I, I ran them yesterday to see if they would terminate by today. They, they, they still haven't. Um, anyways, uh, obvious, another obvious result, um, if we add a thing, then um, if we add like another n, we're gonna have to cover some more squares uh, and we have to cover at most two n plus one squares because that's, that, that you would just hang another layer. Anyway, let's move on to some more interesting stuff. Um, so, what if, crazy idea, what if we generalize to large n by like 
wrapping the grid around a circle. Yeah, yeah. So hear me out, right? What if we let n tend to infinity, and then we can have this wrap around grid? So you see this k equal to phi grid? Well, now it's the now it's like this, but it goes on forever. Uh, mathematicians like doing this a lot. I don't know why. Uh, so you can see that we've actually got the solution that works even if we wrap it around uh, for k equal to five. Ooh, I can do that for k equal to seven. It was like, it was like a staircase. I can I can like hop. It's like a knight's move. You, know, you can hop one two, hop one two, and then wrap around. Um, so that means it will work for n equal for k equal to nine, right? Uh, and k equal to eleven. Yeah. Uh, oh wait, no, 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 it isn't. Um, so. It's a bit weird. Why does it work for this and not for others? And that's something I also set out to prove. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, sets. Lots of sets. Modular arithmetic showed up in here. Um, when you're doing a maths problem, what generally happens is that things get pretty horrible pretty quickly, even if it looks really simple. So I know. So now I know that it's a valid tiling um, with this jump thing, if and only if uh, two and three are not divisible by k. Yeah. Um, so that's why it doesn't work. I'm glad I know now. Uh, I, I also checked it with my solver. Um, so for, for other solutions that aren't just like not multiple of two and three, we have uh, we have to block everything for there. We have to block three quarts there. Uh, that's a cool pattern. Um, unfortunately, there's a much easier non-cool pattern that also does the same job. Uh, we also know that the, uh, this was a, also a cool one I found. You can't actually reduce this anymore. Uh, the density for k equal to four is uh, at least what is at most one over three, so that's nice. Um, and you can see we've got this nice symmetry going on here. Um, you know, this is kind of just an excuse to look at really cool patterns on grids. Uh, they're just formed by maths. Yeah, so uh, some other stuff here and a big old table of stuff. Um, also, because I hate myself, I did high dimensionality on this as well. So, you know, you thought 2D was bad? No, we're going to go up. Um, so, this is what we call a link set. Um, and it's basically like horizontal, vertical, diagonal, the other diagonal. So, now we make the link set like different. And now it can work in three dimensions. Yay! Um, so, here's um, dimension three. Example of the top, middle, and bottom. So, these are different layers of the cube. And this is the minimum for three by three by three. And at this point, I've realized that I've gone too far. Uh, here are some, and also, if we take a solution from the previous dimension, then we can form an upper bound by slapping it on on a bunch of layers. And the second that k becomes too big, we go, oh, no, we're blocking all of that. Uh, and then we keep on carrying on. Uh, yeah, well, project management stuff. This is something you have to mention. Uh, so you have to say that project management went really well uh, and that you met uh, with your supervisor approximately once every one to two weeks. Uh, with additional meetings as necessary. Uh, any less than that, and you will probably lose some marks. Um, <laughs> no, but we, we generally did meet up. I even tried to meet up war with my supervisor, but I think he was telling me not to do that as much anymore, um, which is a bit rude, but sure. Um, I used Notion to write down ideas. If you have a Kanban board, some sort of way to organize yourself, slap it on there. It's nice. Um, right. Um, also, my PC died in turn one. Um, I lost like basically everything that I had. That was nice. Um, back up your stuff. I made sure to do that as soon as it happened. Um, and I'd always make sure to do some work on the project, however minimal, uh, every three to four days. That is definitely always say that, even if it's not true. No, it is true. <laughs> uh, mostly except to my progress report timetable. Uh, I ended up moving things around. Uh, some things I wanted to explore tend to be uninteresting when overgeneralized, like some of the stuff back there. Uh, techniques didn't always work. Feels like a waste of time. A lot of things in your project will feel like a waste of time. Uh, sorry to say that, even if you're doing a non-theoretical one. Uh, conjectures, constantly disproven, weeks after creating them, that always happens. Uh, and of course, it's just the nature of a theoretical project. Um, also, not being able to find anything on my exact problem. The worst thing you can do is not do enough research into your area, and then you go to your presentation, or you submit your final report, uh, and then you find a paper. And that paper does every single thing that your project does. Uh, and no, I'm not about to show that because one doesn't exist, thankfully. Um, but it might, But be careful. You need to make sure to do your research before you start doing your project. Um, as, we, as, like, as annoying as it sounds, as boring as research is, please, please, please do research before you start your project. OK. Uh, any questions? Uh, hopefully, I wasn't super, super long. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
you can't. <laughs> no. Um, I think always having the pro memes with your project supervisor is definitely a good way to go about it. It's good to explore the area at first, but once you identify something that you can actually get results in, that's when you start honing down on that. So originally, my project plan was to actually have, like go into like weird link sets, like what if we made it two? Like what if we had to jump two each time? And that was really cool, but at the same time, it, it kind of lost the essence of the problem, and didn't, it wasn't really a good idea. Uh, but yeah, um, I think you should generally try to, um, like, like if you're doing a theoretical project or if you're not doing a theoretical project, please talk to your supervisor, if they're helpful, um, to, um, to sort of focus you back in on what parts you can actually do. Uh, anything else? Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, thanks very much for, for yeah. Ah, question. How original Sorry. does it have to be? How original does it have to be? Um, well, mine turned out to be uh, quite original. Most of the time, I, I'm not really the, the case study to use here. Um, it's more saying you can do something original, but doing something original is not great if you can't find any research on it and you have to start really searching for those papers that are related. Uh, a lot of the time, project supervisors will have recommended projects. They are there for a reason. That's because they know about that stuff. They know what papers to point you to. So if you are really struggling for project ideas, go to your, go look at your supervisor's recommended projects. There might be something in there that interests you. And it, don't think of it as like the default easy way out. Like They don't pick projects because they're easy. They pick them because they're their field of research. You know, got, your supervisor is supposed to be helping you with something that they're interested in as well as you. So hopefully that makes sense. Excellent. This is working. Cool. All good? Um, I just need to get the pres presentation up. That's the thing. Is this an appropriate distance to hear the volume? Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone, thank you for um, for staying this long. I suppose, um, and also like to thank the previous uh, presenters so far. Uh, my project is a little different from what you might have heard of before. Um, this is a hardware-based project, and there's actually quite a lot less theory. So hopefully, um, it's pretty accessible to everyone. Yeah, Am I in trouble? <laughs> okay. Um, well, my project is. Um, through CSE, which means I work through the engineering department. Who here is on the CSE course? Yeah, let's go. Okay, so you pick through the engineering department's project selection system, uh, which means you have a giant list of projects that um, pretty much all academics in the department will submit to. Uh, you um, apply to ones you like, and you know, uh, it might take one week, it might take a few weeks, but your project will, your project supervisor will either um, ask for a meeting or accept you or reject you. Um, it's always worth talking to your supervisor, your intended supervisor, before starting on a project. You can also propose your own title, um, but in this case, um, my supervisor had an Oculus Quest headset um, that he bought with the department's money, and um, his 
research focus is uh, on studying hand motion coordination. So what do we mean by that? Um, well, there's one specific uh, area that he wanted to study, and that's stick balancing. So this is a problem where you balance uh, something cylindrical on your palm or your fingertip, and you're constantly applying corrective forces in order to keep it upright. Uh, why is it important to study? Well, we want to understand how humans respond when they're presented with a challenging task, for example. Uh, and this task might involve perception through the eyes and how people, and we want to know how people move their hands, their wrists, wrists and their fingers, which is their actuators, uh, to respond to what is being perceived. So you can already see that this is uh, based on control engineering. And I won't go through the entire script of my project presentation as much as I'd like to and as much, as, as much time that I spent on it. Uh, you, will be, you will be probably spending a lot of time refining, represent, representing your project as you go. Um, but generally, you don't start writing the project presentation until, let's say, about three to four weeks before it's actually given, uh, just because you're working still so hard on the actual project content. Um, so a common class of problems uh, when we're trying to understand how humans learn complex skills over time is this stick balancing problem. Um, so you might have heard this as the inverted pendulum problem. Um, so with a traditional pendulum, you have the center of mass above the pivot point, and then the pendulum bob hangs down. Um, and if you disturb it, it will oscillate until it gets back to its equilibrium point. But with an inverted pendulum, the center of mass um, is actually above the pivot point. Uh, and if you give it a force, it will fall over un under the force of gravity, unless you provide a corrective restoring force. So we have already existing, there have been about since the 1970s. It can, I think it might even be a first year engineering project, the self-balancing robot, uh, and also a mechanical controller to keep things upright. So the controller moves the cart to alter the base of the pole, which restores it to the vertical. So the mathematical equations that control the cart are well established, but my project is sort of focusing on whether we can define a mathematical equation for how humans behave. And we would like a system that would help us investigate this. So what we want to try and do with the help of VR, we'll get to that later, uh, is this experiment, essentially. We have a pole being balanced on a palm. The eyes are perceiving that. The eyes pass that data along to the brain through the optic nerve. And there is a time delay from the brain to the hand in which it provides a corrective control action. So in real life, we might have some tactile feedback through the hand as well. Uh, but in VR, no such thing exists because we can only feel um, the fact that we are gripping the controller and nothing else. So there's this one directional pathway you can see in the top diagram um, from the hand to the eyes to the brain. So this might actually be advantageous. We are in the fact that we might only be able to, so in the fact that we might be able to control for what is only visually perceived and we don't have to worry about what the hand feels. So continuing with control systems theory, uh, you might recognize this if you've done ES197 or something similar. Um, we have a more formal statement of what we're interested in. So uh, we have the reference input, which is our goal state, and the fact that we want to keep the pole vertical. And then we have this negative feedback loop uh, where we're trying to control from, for the difference between the reference and what we sense through our eyes, which is the angle from the vertical. So this error gets passed through to the brain, which sends a signal to the hand, and that applies, um, so the hand applies a force to the stick to change its motion. So if we formulate the problem like this, we might be able to get somewhere mathematical, um, but we need to understand what the inputs and outputs of the system are. Uh, this slide essentially sort of justifies why we want to do this project in, in an academic context. Uh, I'm not quite sure if every project needs this, uh, but it's definitely good to provide some uh, reasoning as to why you're doing your project, because otherwise it's useless. Um, I'm, and there's not, I mean, there's nothing inherently bad with a useless project. There's always um, some use, and it can be worth um, analyzing why a project is useful or has less use. Um, so there are various competing academic theories, which is what my supervisor helped me identify. 
Um, on the one hand, we have this uh, intermittent control, so humans don't apply, they don't, they don't try and balance things all the time. It's only when they perceive some sort of threshold, so for example, when the stick angle is um, greater than some certain threshold, um, that that's when they apply the control. Uh, on the other hand, uh, something which might seem more intuitive is that we have um, continuous control, which is what we're doing, it. we are doing it all the time. Um, and we also perhaps might want to investigate um, changes in control over time. So there are some papers out there that tried to quantify how humans improve in their performance when uh, they are given a few weeks to practice. And those claims were not fully substantiated, so perhaps we could fill in the gaps here. Um, and this might have been better defined earlier. Um, sorry, this might have been, this, sorry, this was content that I took from the project, um, God, what is it now? Uh, the project specification. So this, this shows exactly sort of a high level overview of what we want to achieve in the end. Um, and it's important to keep this goal in mind when you're doing a project because otherwise, uh, if you lose track of things, um, you stop being able to uh, make progress. So we want uh, mathematical representation, representation of stick dynamics, ideally. Um, we want to have the precise user input um, through the controller in order to control the stick motion in VR. Um, we want control of experimental parameters, and we want to export experimental data. So why would we also, why are we using VR in the first place? Well, other experiments, they have a huge array of invasive motion tracking cameras placed on the arms and the stick as well. Um, and essentially, that's not very portable. Um, other universities don't tend to have huge LiDAR cameras that can detect small markers. So why don't we have something that is uh, affordable, so you know, in the region of 300 pounds, uh, any, any department can sort of pay for that. Um, and what about if we develop a system to study hand-eye coordination uh, on, a, on a headset? Uh, so my project did involve a bit of software engineering, a bit of programming. Uh, this was the first time I'd use C, Unity in C-sharp. I didn't do everything correctly, and that's something I talked about in my final report. Um, I didn't use best practices for programming. That's also something I talked about in my final report. Um, but I did, I did learn a lot of things. Um, and that's what I would advise you to try and get across. Uh, so I won't explain fully uh, Unity and C-sharp. That's just a basic overview. Um, I'll talk about project management now, even though that wasn't uh, the exact order I gave the presentation in. Um, I, I, because I was writing a piece of code similar to commercial project, pro, um, product, um, I needed to have a way of documenting what I'd done. Um, my workflow was loosely based on Kanban principles. Um, if you've done software engineering, you might decide that that is a good or bad idea for you. Um, I'd have a backlog of tasks to work on each week, and every week I would make a note of what I'd done and move those tasks into the done column, for example. Um, each of the, I broke the small work units down so that they'd only take a few hours to complete. Uh, often working on one task would uh, help with the progress on another task, so my approach uh, helped with parallelism as well. So, um, you know, if I had ran into problems, I could just move a task into the blocked column as well. So that was a sort of easy win to get around any issues while I was developing. Um, and it's also important to when you're presenting or when you're giving a, uh, when, when you're writing a um, report, uh, in order to come up with limitations or talk about why things didn't work, there were disadvantages to using this approach. Um, I was the sole person responsible, which means I had to keep myself accountable. And if you know me, uh, I'm not too good at keeping myself accountable, essentially. Uh, there will be times that I would think that updating this board was a huge chore. Um, and I felt almost overloaded with the amount of documentation and um, extra writing I had to do instead of actually working on the project. Um, and you may notice here that these tasks don't have a definition of done at all. Um, there, it was hard to determine whether I had actually finished something or whether I was just satisfied, it, satisfied with it and I could just call it good enough. Um, and also, 
if you, if you have a system of project management like this, it doesn't mean that you end up actually following it. Um, but at the same time, if you break something down into work units, it's, it helps you think about the project and what you want to achieve. Uh, so I'll get on to results now. Um, this is essentially what I came up with in the little, the little time I had. Um, we have very basic hand models, uh, a ping pong bat, which we balance things on, um, and we have some instructions in front of us. We can change the parameters of the stick in, um, according to what we want to investigate at any given time. Um, and then we do that using slider values, and then we start the project uh, on the right-hand side, and you can see that we're holding a ping pong bat. The hand's disappeared because uh, we don't actually need to see the hand, um, and we're keeping the stick upright. Um, we can't really do um, palm balancing on VR just yet. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, the closest thing we have is we are gripping the controller, which is gripping an object in VR. Uh, so the experiment continues until we exceed some certain stick angle. Uh, and then the, the stick will turn red and the experiment is over. We can reset. Um, and once we do each experiment, we have data export to um, something like MATLAB which can plot in 3D the trajectory of the tip of the stick and also the hand movements. So if you remember when I had that control systems uh, theory diagram, uh, we wanted to, to see if there was a transfer function or a mathematical mapping between uh, the input and the output. Uh, so that's essentially what this has enabled. We haven't quite got to the mathematics in this project yet, but I was hoping that uh, by developing the project and for this year, next year, uh, other students could develop it further. And this is actually quite common in engineering. Uh, they will give you, so supervisors will run a project repeatedly year after year where they'll be building on previous results. Um, and this is something I accounted for. Uh, there's plenty of ways that we could try and extend the project and give more, give future project students more work to do. Uh, I'll end with, um, a quick insight into what we could do. So I spent a few weeks researching how hand tracking could be used to interact with objects in order to more, uh, more closely mimic a real life situation. So as you can see, uh, the hands, which are detected by external cameras on the headset, uh, they can make the hands look very real and follow the movements precisely. Unfortunately, this doesn't really transfer well to interact to interactions with objects. Um, we can't actually grab things quite yet. Um, there's a, there, there is one uh, game that uses it called uh, Hand Physics Lab, which is currently the world leader in using hand tracking technology. Um, but they were very mean about sharing their technology and they directed me to a $6,000 course on how to do what they did. Um, and some advice I would give to you is if you have a hardware or software project that you plan to demo in the presentation, please make a video backup, because if it doesn't work on the day, then I think you're hemorrhaging marks that way. Um, so yeah, that is a typical run through the project. Um, I'll take questions while it runs, if anybody has any, maybe CSE related. Yes, please. How closely do you think um, the, the results that will be output from the program will actually match the mathematical model? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the thing is, it's ve what I found that was it's actually pretty easy to balance a stick in VR. Um, so uh, I'm hoping free future project students can take that on. Um, but in terms of in well, the mathematical model I came up with in term one was basically my, my supervisor saying to me, uh, you need to get the mathematical background in uh, modeling a stick and like the 3D dynamics. Um, what we found that was because there was so much noise in the system, um, there's so much uh, sh handshaking, for example, um, the fact that sometimes the, the forces on the ping pong bat don't actually translate to the stick, it's almost impossible to uh, match the mathematical model. So uh, that might be something that has to be reassessed, yeah. All right, thank you very much.
I mean, it's one peak, but it's not chaining touch. Oh, um, that's fine. Take on. Sorry for the noise. Might want to switch your presentation on. Oh uh, yes. Hel hello. Okay. So. Hello. So, my uh, my original plan was to go over my presentation. However. I'm concerned we are running out of time, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly go over this, and I'm going to explain some uh, some tips about the the, uh, the project in, in general. So the title that you got given is actually wrong. That was my original title, and it got changed like near the start to comparison of binary and ternary CPUs. So the idea was that in uh, in recent times, performance is not increasing as we as much as we want it to. So we need to find solutions to this. And uh, my, my, my possible solution was to use ternary. This is a, a ternary machine built back in the, uh, in the 70s by Russia. Uh, but it didn't take off because the Russian government shut it down because they were like, this is, this is, we don't want to go too far out of a uh, university or like theoretical uh, things. And uh, this is ternary, so instead of two states of true and false with binary, we've instead got three states. Um, there's two ways to do it, either balanced or unbalanced. Um, each have their benefits and um, disadvantages. Uh, I'm, going with uh, I'm going with balanced, so we have true, false, and unknown for our three states. And then using that, we can then construct some logic here uh, it works similar to binary logic. And then this is why ternary theoretically could be faster. So using the, uh, the, the, the Radix, Radix economy uh, and then getting all these equations and then plotting that graph. The, uh, the highest, it, or the, the minimum integer here is three. So that's, that's the theoretical side in terms of why it increased performance. Uh, Basically, you can store more data in smaller number of symbols. So you can then do stuff like have more uh, words per cache line. And then you can then exploit that with the very long instruction words. Uh, and then this is just the project's breakdown. So we're going to be making a simulation compilers to actually test the theories behind it. Uh, and then I thought this was quite interesting. My supervisor brought this up. Uh, so I always was thinking this was going to be an emulator, but then my supervisor was like, it, it seems more like a simulator, and then I went back and researched the difference, and it, it is more of a simulator, so an emulator just basically mimics the behavior of the machine, whereas the simulator actually models the machine itself, and then it's just, it has more information about the machine, and then you can run more diagnostics on it. And then the, these are some more reasons to why you would use a simulator. Uh, so in terms of tools, this seems very weird to put in your presentation. But for some reason, you need to talk about tools. So I just put this in. Uh, and then again, project management, I think it's a bit weird to put in a present presentation uh, about the project. So it's just here to, uh, to hopefully get the marks. And then 
talking about some models of uh, the CPU that I based it off of. Uh, I'm just going to skip all of this because it's a bit boring. Uh, and then this is how I, uh, I adapted the, uh, the, the, uh, the model that I was using. Uh, it turns out that I didn't actually base it off this. I just randomly just changed all, literally everything about the model. So it turns out I didn't actually base it off this model anyway. So, yep. And then this is just the instruction set. Again, this has nothing to do with the model that I, uh, I apparently based it off of. But that's fine. As long as, <clears throat> as long as you can just explain what's going on, they probably won't care. Uh, and again, it's just more random things that, about the, uh, the machine. And this is the first part where I've, this is the actual difference that we shrunk the words from uh, 32 bits to 21 trits. And then we have our, com have our compiler here, or assembler. So we have our assembly, assembly uh, program here. And it gets compiled to binary and ternary. And as you can see, that we have a smaller, smaller program for ternary. So obviously, as I'm doing tests, I need to make sure that the, uh, the results are reliable and fair. I have given a fair chance between uh, the two systems. So there's just some things that I've spoken about to uh, make sure that the results are reasonable. Uh, there was a demo, but. Again, it's just me running a command to run all the tests, and then you get the results out at the end. So I'll just look, show you the results. So we have our factorial program that we showed. And as you can see, there was no speed up at all. Fantastic. Uh, but the reason was because ternary would have a speed up because it requires memory accesses less. And the factorial program is so small that the amount of memory accesses are literally identical. So it's fine. So we have binary sort here. Uh, and we have a slight speed up. Um, not, not that much. And, but what I found is looking through the program, uh, the alignment of the, the, uh, the instructions uh, fit more into towards binary words than ternary words. So the ternary words had six instructions per word. And the binary had four, which is where the speed up should come from. And the program itself uh, was more aligned towards binary. So I just added like a couple of no-ops right at the start. And that's all they that changed. And it went from being not much faster to being 5% faster. So there's a massive difference there. So that can obviously have some problems with the, uh, the results. But I spoke about that in the, in the presentation or in the uh, dissertation at the end. And then we just went for a huge matrix multiplication. As you can see, we have low clock cycles there. And we have about 3% increase in speed. And there's just more tests. And then again, we have a binary search here. It's, it's really strange how the binary ones initially start off with binary being better. But then once we add a few no-ops to the start, we get, we get it to be a ternary being a bit faster. Uh, so the best case, we had 4 to 5% speed up. That's not inherently the best. I was expecting like at least 20%. So that kind of, you know, made me a bit confused. Uh, and I looked into actual uh, performance of CPUs right now, binary CPUs, and they are improving about 5% each year. So they're about the same. So why would we switch over? Uh, well, binary currently has been optimized all the way from like the start of computing, and everyone's been working binary. So there's all like these optimizations specifically targeted towards that. So if if we start developing ternary now, we're, we're going to find some optimization of ternary. So maybe that's better than. And then right now, all the infrastructure is binary based. So we can't just flip a switch and say now we're going to use ternary. So we need to develop the hardware a bit more. My suggestion is to uh, use microcontrollers and stuff like that for like solo or like standalone machines. Uh, again, just limitations. These are just stuff that I'm putting in to just get the marks. So uh, programs have more alignment towards binary and ternary, as I just discussed. Uh, so and, XOR, and OR have different results based on either one, because we have those extra. Uh, extra five um, outputs that we can get from the logic gates. 
So the programs that you can, you can't just put a program that has and in and expect it to work on both. And then extensions, so the, the CPU was quite naive and it was pretty bad. So it's pretty basic, so just make it a bit better. And then just make the assembler. The assembler is really horrible to use, so I would probably add, make that bit better and then make more programs. And that, that, is, that, is, that is all of that. Does anyone have questions about my project before I go into tips? Hello. Uh, so if you remember back at the start, the radix economy, like the theoretically, the uh, ternary should be better, which is why I only looked into ternary. However, the higher we go up, it's going to be more complicated to actually implement that in hardware. Ternary is already really hard to implement in, in hardware already. We have no idea how to store trits right now, which is like a major problem of why I sw swapped my, uh, my title. Okay. So I was saying, uh, from memory, the more people use the binary signals, have a massive gap between them for reducing the effect of binary noise. Uh, how is ternary effected by this? Okay, so if we go back right to the, uh, the balanced versus unbalanced, the reason why I chose balanced was because uh, balanced can use AC, whereas with unbalanced, it's more representative of DC. So uh, with this gap, uh, with the DC version, you'd have to amplify the voltage up. So it has like an extra level, and you would have an extra gap there. But with the AC version, you basically just take that positive value and add an additional one that's negative. So the positive would be true, the zero would be false, uh, unknown, and the minus would be false. <coughs> Hello. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I would like to have the answer to this without, like, off the top of my head, but I did not actually look into that, and I'm glad that my assessor and second assessor did not ask this question in the in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for not having the answer. Okay, I guess we're gonna move on to, uh, on to tips. So I made a bunch of notes during the other presentations. So uh, don't worry about order. I definitely didn't order this based on who went first. So the first questions were not the first people. Okay, so, uh, so talking about project successfulness. So if your project fails, it didn't, okay? So basically, your project was always a success no matter what happened. Even if, you know, you have no work, you did nothing on your project, your project was a success. Specifically, in your dissertation, you should have a line that says, my project was a success. So, if you have a look, my project was a success because, so always have that line, okay? Uh, and also, someone said that you can't change the project. That is, that is not true. You can change the project. My original, was, my original project was to actually develop a ternary computer. But after looking into it, <laughs> I can't do that. So I just said to my supervisor, yeah, I can't do that. So could, could I change my project? And they were like, yeah. So it is possible to change your project. So don't worry about deciding right now, and then you have a whole summer to figure out what the actual project is. You can change it. Uh, someone asked a question about if you make a pro if you make a your project that is like a a product, can you sell it? Yes, you can, but in, in theory, the university owns the rights to your project, so you have to talk to the university and be like, "I want to sell my project," and then they have to sign over the uh, the rights to you. It's a whole big thing. Uh, if you want to sell it, good for you. Get a lot of money, cool, but it's going to be a hassle. Uh, okay, this is a very important thing. Your supervisor marks your work. So, be nice with them. Get them on your side. If they hate you, they're not gonna help you out because they're the ones marking it, so they're the ones giving you the marks 
And then when they say, do this, that means you're going to get the marks if you do it. And if you don't, you won't. So just have a good rapport with your supervisor. So in terms of picking a project, you can pick literally anything and go to a supervisor and be like, yeah, I have this really random idea that's really unfeasible and the scope is huge. And they'll be like, right, OK, that's fine. Let's just pick this small section of it and go with that. The supervisor knows what's possible, and they'll reduce your scope so that you can actually feasibly finish your project. So no matter how wild you think your idea is, talk about it. Supervisors love random ideas. When I spoke to my supervisor, they were like, I've never heard of anyone trying to do ternary before. And then I was like, well, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it turned out it was quite all right. It was uh, not, the bad, not, the, not the worst uh, experience. Uh, what else is on here? OK, so you're going to pick your project. When was it? The 1st of June, I think it was said. So um, you have all summer to do work on it, right? Do work on it over the summer. The first supervisor meeting that you have with your supervisor when you come back, the first thing they'll ask is, what have you done over the summer? And if you say, I've been playing video games, they're going to be like, oh, this person is not very uh, interested in the project. And then they're going to have a bad opinion of you and then not help you out. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the, uh, the writing of the report at the end, use a template and use LaTeX as well. Anyone not using LaTeX should get zero. So on Overleaf, I don't know if you've seen Overleaf. It's really good. I'm not sponsored by Overleaf. Uh, but if you go to make a new project and go down to uh, thesis at the bottom here, you can then scroll all the way down to the bottom of this page. And then there's University of Warwick listed here. Click on that. And then you can click the, uh, this template here. And then you can uh, use a template and has everything on it. And it tells you like what stuff to delete if you don't want it. It tells you what to add here. It's really good. I use this. I think most people use this or a, a pro template of some sort. But definitely use a template because otherwise your project will look really bad. Um, so an interesting story about my, uh, my project is that uh, in an in, I, I in, did an internship interview. And the whole interview, I spent talking about my, my, uh, my project. And then I got the job. So that's pretty good. And then the funny, an even funnier story is, the next week was my, my, uh, my presentation. And one of the questions was, in an interview, if they asked you about your project, what would you say? So I already had one of the answers fully, uh, fully answered. So that was pretty good. And then talking about the, uh, the questions, I would also suggest looking into uh, a few similar areas around. So even if it doesn't make sense, uh, one of the questions was, how does this work with quantum? And, and I had no idea, but I didn't even look up that. But because I knew about quantum, I just, spoke, I just said everything I knew about quantum. And they're like, that's the perfect answer. And I was like, sure, that's great. OK, there was a, a presentation about ML. OK, people that know me know that I don't like ML. So this is going to be extremely biased, but I would not suggest doing an ML project. If you want to, that's perfectly fine. But basically, everyone wants to do an ML project, right? And if your second assessor is sitting there listening to five presentations a day for two weeks, and then you come along on like day 10, Here's an ML project about something really, really similar to someone else that something's done. They're going to get bored. Have something that's really interesting and really different. But obviously, don't listen to me. I am biased against ML. But that, that is what I suggest. OK, another, 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 another one of our in, uh, the uh, questions at the, uh, the presentation. Uh, the common question is, if you were to do your project again, what would you do differently? So basically, I heard this, this is a uh, common question. 
So I prepared for this before, and luckily it came up. So I had the perfect answer sculpted. So I know exactly what to say, and that was that. Uh, also, your second assessor gets uh, revealed beforehand. So once you, uh, get, once you see your second assessor, look into them. So if you, if you have a good like, rapport with your, uh, your supervisor, and you think that having a few jokes in your presentation might help, and your second assessor is like really, really strict and really, really academically minded, you may want to remove those jokes, because that's not going to go down well. And then uh, during, the, uh, during the spring break, you may think, oh, I'm going to get this, uh, this, this dissertation written up before then, so I can have a lot of breaks in, in, the actual, uh, in the actual holiday. This is incorrect. You will spend your whole break freaking out about your dissertation, and then finally get it in like the day before the uh, deadline. No matter how far through you've got, this thing here is going to take up your whole mind during that holiday, no matter what. No matter how far you are through, you're going to make it as perfect as you think you, think you can make it. But however, I do suggest that take some breaks and also look at some exams. Even though they start like four weeks into the term three, that's still probably not enough time to, ex to study everything. So take breaks and study in those breaks or something. Uh, I don't know if you've, not, if you've been told this, but um, on Tabula, there's like, a meetings button, and it says like record supervisor meeting. You should probably record the supervisor meeting. I had to write them out myself. It was pretty pretty boring, and I also often forget. But those are monitoring points, and then you get emails from the uni saying, "What's going on? Where have you been? Are you still at uni?" So make sure to do that. Um, okay, I got a few more. So people have asked about putting URLs in your dissertation, where to put them. Uh, I personally don't like having them in references, and I just have them as footnotes, but it's personal choice. I would recommend footnotes because I think references are for like academic papers and stuff. Uh, I can't remember who said it, but someone said about code. I think it was Ollie said about code not being the best. Uh, oh. Yeah, so code isn't actually assessed. You just have to submit it to make sure that it works and your results actually line up with what your code produces. If your code just prints out you know, like some results that you just randomly put in without actually doing any calculations, they'll look at that and be like, these results are not actually correct. So as long as the code looks like it's doing something, then you're good to go. OK, I'd like Greg to shut, shut their ears because this, this part shouldn't be heard by an assessor. Basically. Throughout your project, you're not going to plan for project management, right? <laughs> so basically, when it comes to the presentation, you have to lie and say that you did do good project management throughout the whole of the, of the year because that's how you get the marks. Even if you haven't, you just lie and say you did. That's what I did. I think everyone else did that as well. It's going to happen. I think they even know it. But yeah, you're going to have points where you're just like, yeah, I should probably include this. Even though it doesn't, didn't actually happen, I should definitely do this. Uh, that, that is all of the stuff I've written down. Does anyone have any random questions? OK, fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, so as you can probably tell by now, we've reached the end of the talks. Uh, what this means is that for those of us who are still remaining, who have done talks, we'll be happily down here and ready to ask any questions. So feel free to come down. Also, feel free to come down and grab a waffle, because uh, we've got enough to go around, I think. So yeah. Thanks very much, Gwen. Uh, we're going to disable the stream. We're going to like turn off the stream now. So thank you to people.